Uh, we're filming this, so I gotta watch my language. I, everybody knows. <laughs> I can do a few f bombs and stuff like that, so it it'll be fairly clean. Which means that this is an unusual town hall type. <laughs> so uh, anyway, I, I'm just gonna go in uh, ten minutes of who I am, because some of you guys don't even know who I am. Um, I came here 10 years ago from North Carolina, so what did I do before that? Well, I uh, grew up really in Philadelphia, and then when I was 15 years old, uh, my dad worked for Sitco, and he got uh, transferred from the area office in the Northeast, which was Philadelphia, down to their uh, world headquarters in Tulsa, Oklahoma, which was a big culture shock for me to go from the hustle and bustle of the Northeast um, to uh, Oklahoma. So, uh, two years in uh, Philadelphia high schools, Roy Plymouth meeting, if you know that, then uh, two years in Tulsa, Tulsa Memorial, and then um, I bubbled around with drugs and stuff, and finally got my act together and went to OU. I actually graduated from OU. So, uh, and my major was electrical engineering and computer science. And in the 70s, that was the thing to be. I mean, because if you wanted jobs, there was jobs out the kazoo. There wasn't hardly anybody with a computer science degree back then uh, in the late 70s. I had many, many different opportunities. The largest computer company at that time was IBM. It, Microsoft didn't even exist. Uh, Apple wasn't, you know, wasn't even a blip on the radar. Um, and IBM was, had a very good package in any way. Uh, I was fortunate to work for them for 25 years and then in 2005 they had like a, a force march. The division I worked with um, went off into um, Lenovo, if you're familiar with the ThinkPad line. And uh, anyway, I, I finished my career. I get three pension checks, isn't that cool? So I get three. I don't even need this freaking job, to be honest with you. So, um, but you know what? I, I mean, I made crazy. I was a sales executive first here in Dallas in the 80s and the early 90s. So I used to call on uh, Pier 1 in Fort Worth, Frito Lay, uh, TXU, they're called, uh, uh, what, what the hell? They, they, they were something else, but TXU was my customer. Uh, Exxon Mobil, they were here. So I call on these customers, big deal. And then um, they promoted me to the division headquarters in North Carolina, and I was there, and then I became an international rep. So I flew all over the world, which was kind of cool. Um, the reason why I kept my job, now, I, let me back up. I was a drug addict in my early teenage years, and probably, well, yeah, probably my teenage years, I was a, a drug addict. I mean, my drug of choice back then was speed, which is like math, it's amphetamine. Um, okay, and you know how hyper I am, I used to ah. bounce off the ah. And anyway, that wound me up into the uh, state hospital, and it really did. Um, and um, so anyway, I got off of that, I went in the marijuana maintenance program, and that screwed me up. I, I was paying for my own college education, flunking out, blah, blah, blah. And so, um, one night with my fraternity brothers and I um, went out drinking and I go, you know what, this has kind of the same effect. And so I, you know, I just switched my drug of choice. I switched my drug of choice from speed to marijuana to alcohol. And I, I am an addict and I'm alcohol. And the beauty about Soul's Heart, we treat the disease the same. So if you're only a drug addict, that's fine. We understand that. If you're only an alcoholic, that's fine. But it's the same disease here. Now, sometimes when you go to AA meeting, they don't want to hear about drugs, and that's cool. You just got to be cognizant of it. In fact, today, today marks 80 years that the AA Big Book came out. Um, and AA's been around for 84 years in June of this year. And that's the mother of all 12 steps. And they didn't come around till. Um, the late 50s, or early, uh, late 50s, or early 60s, or maybe it's late 50s. But that was spawned off of people that had already been in AA, and they said, you know what, we got more of a drug problem than an alcohol problem than that brought in AA, and then of course CA, and then all the other 12 steps came out of that. So anyway, that, that's kind of where I'm at, so I relate. So how did I keep my job? 
But see, I figured out right away, if I lost my job, I'm totally screwed. Right? Then you can't pay the bills, you can't pay the, your house bill, you can't pay the car bill. I knew that right away. I said, you know what? If I do that. So what I, I did when I did, by the way, drug addiction and alcoholism is a progressive disease. What does that mean? It means that it gets worse and worse and worse, which means it takes more pills, more drugs, more alcohol to get you at a level where you're comfortable at. All right? And let me just make a, a little point right here. About a third of those guys up there had some clean time, right? They had maybe a couple, two, three months, and then they went back out, all right? And they went back out, and their system is totally shot because it's like, whoa! I'm not used to, I'm used to being clean. And now I'm doing heroin, right? Or meth. But most of them are heroin addicts. And your system can't take it. And what that costs? Overdose, right? And see, that's the problem with the disease is we can't control it. If we can control it, you wouldn't be here. Right? I wouldn't. Right? So that, that's the disease. So that's kind of my background. Um, you know, I was uh, called... 10 years ago, in the summer of, of, of 2009, come here, I've seen 1,200 cops coming through these doors, right? And I always say, I want to meet the guy who comes back in this door and says, you know what, Brent? I'm partying like a rock star. I'm getting all the women. Everything's going great. And I'm still drinking drugs. <coughs> How many guys do you think out of 1,200 have done that? Zero. Zero. Right? The guys that have been here and relapsed, they come with their tail between their legs and go, oh, it's worse this time. Why is it worse? Because it's a progressive disease. It gets worse, worse, worse. So, you know, I'm here at my pay. In fact, I make a joke, but it's true. I would get paid more uh, running at McDonald's with less headache than running this place. You get paid a hell of a lot more. Uh, I don't get medical. I don't get dental. I mean, I'm jealous. I'm sponsoring a guy who makes... Oh, probably twenty thousand dollars more than me, but he gets paid vacations, he gets this, he gets that, all these benefits I'm going. And he's only been down at the job for a year. I've been here for ten years. <coughs> but that isn't why I'm here for. I'm not here for the money. I'm here because of you. That's why I'm here. Because I see guys that change their entire lives. And you'll see that two weeks from this today at birthday night. All right, so birthday night is Wednesday night, and if and you guys experience birthday night, and you see guys that have been here and tell your story, well, I used to be in maintenance, or I used to be in the kitchen, or I used to be on the trucks, or I used to be whatever, and their whole life has changed. Why? Because they're sober and clean. That's what this place does. And what we did many, many years ago, uh, eight years ago, we said we aren't going to we aren't going to mimic shelters out there. We're going to mimic treatment centers. So that's what we do. We take the same programs that the treatment center and give it to you guys for free. And in fact, I had the opportunity to visit two treatment centers uh, last month, and I'm going, they don't even have the stuff we have. They don't have sponsorship. They don't have the cognitive piece. They don't have the relationship piece that we have in Anthem. They have a lot of stuff that we have and that you guys are benefiting from. So anyway, that, that's who I am. And now I said, you know what? This disease definitely. This disease is serious. It ain't like, you know, some fat person who's on a diet, right? And says, screw it, and I'm going to go off the diet and I'm going to start eating a bunch of chocolate cake and ice cream and that kind of stuff, right? When we relapse, what does NA say? People that don't get recovered. Jails, institutions, or death. You're in an institution, so you got two options. Your two options are jail, and after you've done jail a while, you get promoted, right? You graduate to prison. How many of you guys have been in prison? Right? So we got about two, almost 20 guys. 20 out of 50 guys here. Right? So that's what, what happens. You graduate. Or death. And I said, you know what? 
And I remember three or four guys dying in their disease. I said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to set up a wall here. And we're going to kind of commemorate but tell how these guys died in their addiction. And that's what this wall was. We filled that wall up, and then we started this wall. And I counted it this morning. I'm going, there's three guys up there that isn't up there. There should be 32, 33 guys, and I think there was like I don't know, 29 or whatever. So I'm going to go back and find out who's missing and stick them back up there. So we got that wall full, and we got that wall full. Right? And so today, I get to add somebody else on the wall. All right? And this guy was here at Souls Harbor for almost a year and a half, February 2014 to July 2015. Now this guy is different. By different I mean most of us came from either lower class or middle class, right? I mean in general. When I see 1,200 guys, I rarely see, rarely see guys from the upper class that are here. Why? Because their family bails them out and sends them to expensive treatment. Now, we do have another guy up there, um, Rob, who used to be one of our truck drivers who went to St. Mark's School, if you know where that is, in Dallas, that's where all the hoity-toity kids go, right? Right? And he, and he was here, and the reason why he was here was he used to have a uh, condo down by uh, the American Airlines Center, you know where that is, like in Victory Park, a real nice condo, and he had a trust, you know what a trust is, right? So he got money from his dad's thing, his dad had passed away, and he's living high on the hog, drinking, drugging, whatever. <coughs> Finally, his three sisters said, enough! And they yanked the trust away from him. And so he became like us, and so he came here. And long story short, he died on December 31st of a concoction of drugs and alcohol, all right? And he's up there too, Rob. Um, but anyway, so I'm back to this guy. This guy uh, was here a year and a half, and, you know, he, he, would, he was a telemarketer. He could never stay sober and clean. And... Uh, <coughs> His big deal is he got in some accident, I think he fell down, and he cut the heck out of his leg, right? So he had this big wound scab on his leg, right? And yeah, it hurt, so what did he do? Did he go to his doctor and say he's an addict and alcoholic? No. So what did they what did they prescribe to him? Painkillers, right? Which is exactly what he wanted. He wanted those painkillers. Because now he has a prescription. To me, the pill poppers are the most dishonest people around. Because they'll say, I have a prescription. <laughs> I have a prescription. I connived and jived and said all this BS to, to my doctor so I can get screwed up for free. That's, and oh, I got a prescription. I got, I got this bad I had a guy who was in a car accident eight years ago, and he's still on opiates, mm. on painkiller. Oh, I had that. Give me a freaking break. Word. Right? But that's what we do. That's what we do. We will make up stories to keep that addiction alive. So you know what this guy did? Good. With this scab? Good. He kept scratching it. <laughs> <laughs> I hear that, and that's the truth. And I would say, Quit scratching it! But why did he scratch it? Because oh, so he'd go back and go, Right? Because that's what he wants to do. He wants the doctor to prescribe him opiates to him. Because he knew once it got better, guess what? The doctor says, you don't need that. So he had, now, this is a true story. He had that going on for five years. Five years he... And see, that's the thing is, his doctors don't care. Right? So what does opiates do? He was overweight. It screws up with the heart rate. And he had a massive heart attack in life. Because of the opiates. And he was 
58 years old. He, by the way, he grew up in Holland Park. How many of you guys know where Holland Park is? Right? Okay. That is not the slum. Right? His dad was a big time lawyer here in, in Dallas. He had trust money, but he pissed away in three or four months. Which is what alcoholics and addicts do. Right? We get a bunch of money, and it's like, woohoo, party! Right? And so, uh, you know, this, this is, this guy goes up on the wall. His name is Jeff Sales. Some of you may know him, some may uh, you not. Know, but anyway, I'm going to pass that around. Uh, a couple other guys that I thought were, okay, but first of all, how many guys out there, and again, we have 30-something, right? How many guys thought that that day when they woke up, they're going to die? Well, they, they knew who was going to kill them. The, the logical answer is zero, right? But this is a trick question. The answer is really one. One guy knew he was going to die. You know why? Because he just got his third DWI. He got his third DWI and he knew he graduated from jail to prison. He knew that. Right? And when he was here, I remember his name's Coy. Coy's this big cowboy tough guy with a big pickup truck and all this stuff. And good, great guy, great truck driver, great worker. But you know what? He was a pussy. You know why he's a pussy? Even though he's a big truck guy? He go, my wife left me. <laughs> my wife left me. And he was so angry at his wife. And you know what I told him? Your wife was dumb enough to stay, hang around for you for so many years. She should have dumped your butt a long, long time ago. You go, Ugh! but that's the truth. That is the truth. If you have somebody that loves you, probably besides your mom, especially if it's a spouse or girlfriend or significant other, they should have liked you a long time ago, especially if they're a normie, which his wife was a normie. So anyway, he gets his third DWI. He has to go to court, and he knew. He knew. So the day before he goes to court, he gets a rope. He gets drunk. He writes a note to his wife and says, You did this to me! No, no, but see, you did it to your fucking self. <laughs> Right? You did it to yourself. And he hung himself. He hung himself. See, that's what the disease wants you. This disease wants you dead. Dead. And so that's poor. Alright? And here. I'll pass him on. Alright? This guy was... One of the most artistic, in fact, he was probably the most artistic guy here. His name was Sam. And Sam came from Abilene or Amarillo, out there near West Texas. And um, a really quiet guy, a very nice guy. And, uh, you know, 30 day restriction, you all know what the 30 day restriction is, right? 30 days, you're kind of confined here, you can't go on passes, blah, 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 blah. Right. So his 30 days was over, and he was 26 years old. Right. So that's young. So his 31st day, he goes, Woohoo! I don't, I'm not on restriction anymore. So he bought a bus pass. At that time it was $3 instead of $4 for us. And he bought a bus pass, and he went and proceeded right there to, you know, the 7 Eleven across from the Western <coughs> Station, right? He, get, he hit a bunch of tall boys, right? He got drunk on the rail, and he started, here's this quiet little, young little guy who now becomes like me. Well, I got drunk. I was obnoxious. Right? And he becomes obnoxious, and guess what happened? 
The guy on the train got sick of him because he bumped into him because he's so drunk. You know what he did? Pulled out his knife and cut him. Yeah. Right on the throat. Boom. Unfortunately, Sam didn't die right away. He died about three days later in Parker. But see, that, these are the thoughts that go through you guys' head when they go, Whoa, oh, I don't have restriction, right? Think of Sam. You think Sam would want to do over? I gave you one. Now, last guy, this, this one, yeah, I did. I know each one of these guys up here. I know each one of their stories. This guy was just wild. <coughs> Right? He did some serious damage here at Souls Harbor, and he was just a mess. I think we gave him two or three chances here at Souls Harbor, got him on meds, but still, he was a mess, right? So, when he was high, he really didn't drink that much. When he was high, he was just hell on wheels. And, you know, we, we couldn't stand it. Right? I mean, guys here would say, Brent, you need to kick this guy out. I said, well, let's give him another, another day or two. Maybe he'll straighten out, right? He did. So he goes back living with his mom. He goes back living with his mom, and his mom got sick of it. You know what she did? Shot him. Killed him. His own mom. Boom! She brought him into her life, and she took him out of life. That's where this disease takes you. The one who loves you the most that we crap on says, enough. How many of you guys have family with firearms? Yeah. Third straight now. Third straight now. That's Jason Scott. Right, so we have these guys up there. So that's what the wall is for. And I read the obituary and I figure out the obituaries in the newspapers now, I, I, to be honest, I pulled two or three guys, the richer guys, out of the obituary. Mostly we hear about your death through friends, because you're all friends here. And they'll go, hey, did you know Jimmy relapsed and he died? And I go, how did he die? Well, he was at, you know, he, he OD'd on heroin. Heroin is just the worst drug up there. I like to set a third of those guys up there, and you typically go, you don't know if you're going to get good stuff or bad stuff, right? And for you guys, like I said before, that are clean and sober for a while, they, your system isn't used to it. So here we just like, ooh, right? So anyway, that's the wall. The wall is there for your purpose, because this disease is real. It is real, and I know every single one of them. I know most of the uh, parents for these guys. Uh, so now I'm going to switch gears, but it kind of goes back to wall. So, I've lived in that house. In fact, when I, I call it the crack house, wow. the house I used to live in, wow. because they used to smoke crack in my house before I got it. Okay, not they were there, I probably didn't think he's going to see you tomorrow, right? But, so before I came, they used to do crack in that house. It was, and this was the guy who was running the place with staff members, right? And I knew it. I saw, you know, burnout marks in the carpets. And, uh. So anyway, I used to talk, the first three or four years, I always used to refer, not as the house, but as the crack house, because that was so anyway, the problem with that house is it's very, very old. And they put it, they, the uh, pillars, they really some pillars. It was built on tree trunks, right? And so what do tree trunks do after 50, 60 years? They, mold. they decay, right? Yeah. They mold. And so the right. floor is shifting. We have, in the uh, computer room there, it goes down like that. All right, and we have holes in the anyway. So back to the house, no dishwasher. I mean, I was just like for about a year that I was mad at God for putting me in that house. Right now, I was just like, okay, this is part of the territory. Right, this is part. This 
This is the reason why I'm over there, is to help you guys. And so now I'm grateful. But right? back the first year, I wasn't grateful, and that, that was on me. But the problem with these holes is, guess when it gets cold, what happens? Little field mice come up there, right? And, and, and I don't know if you ever guy, guys been to NASCAR, you know, the NASCAR or the Indy, you know, open wheel. They go so fast, but the NASCAR. <laughs> yeah, and so you have to, in NASCAR, you're an open wheel. You have to kind of train your eye to foul those cars. That's the same with the mice. I didn't realize there's all these mice, field mice. I'd see the little droppings and stuff. I didn't know what the hell was going on. But then once you train your eye, they go, oh, there he is. I can see him. So I had these field mice, right? And so, you know, I got all these suggestions, right? One of the suggestions was, get rid of the field mice. You stick a broomstick with a bucket of water, and on the broomstick you put cornflakes on there. And then on the top of water you put more cornflakes. And so the, the little field mice go up the broom, and then they go, oh, there's some more. And then it goes into water, and they're all, oh, look at that, buddy, right there. So that's one way to but the problem is, is after, after a week, guess what happens? It becomes ineffective because the other field mice have figured it out. Right? Don't go down there. Don't go down there. Don't, don't do that. Because, because we know what's going to happen. So then I would have these glue traps. You ever seen the glue traps? They're great, and you know, it's like they step in and they're like, ugh, 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 and, you know, especially when the body's in it, and then they're like tearing and ripping their bodies out of it, and they're like trying to get out of it. But they're stuck. They're stuck. And so they're still squirming around, and then what I do is I can put a sack on them. But then what happens after a week or so? It's in the fact of why. Why is it any effective? Because they're going, don't, don't go by that glue. Even though that, that little peanut butter is there, don't, 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 don't do it. Right? And so we, I had this elaborate cage, right? And I put both peanut butter and cheese on there. Right? And same deal. They figure it out after a week. Then my favorite, I call it the tunnel of love. Because it's like this black mailbox. Can you imagine a mailbox? Okay. And on one end is the peanut butter, and then on the other end is an open area, right? So open areas is where they come in, they, they, they sniff, and they see the peanut butter, it's all dark. And once they get near the, uh, where the peanut butter is, it has an electric charge. And, that, and you can actually hear, right? And so it cries. But what happens? After we, they figured it out. What, the, what in the Sam Hill does this have to do with recovery? Because there's our dead mice. There's our dead mice. And they're telling you, don't ever drink or drug again. Otherwise, you're going to end up there. All right? So that's, that's the gist of the story. Okay, we'll, we'll stop. It. Oh, uh, one last story. Is it still filming? Okay, so all of a sudden the, the mice, and then we got rats too, who are coming in to the house, and this is a couple years ago, and all of a sudden they're gone. They're gone. How the heck did they go? Now I still have no rats. And there would be like a mound of hair, like here and then here. I can figure it out. And one day, you know, at 7.30, I do, do the job roster and the prayer. I came back, and guess what was in my house? Yes, a bowl of constrictor. And how I many people know Gary's wife, Kevin? It's funny, all these guys are like you and me. Like, oh, I don't want to get that stick. Kevin better go out and get that stick. She's wrestling with it because this is a big freaking stick. <laughs> Did you take a picture of that? No, you got to bring it over here. Okay, here, here. Let, let me get it to David so he can see the bow of construction.
Is that good? Yeah. Okay. I'm both. Yes, I know both. That's what they told me. I don't know. I know Cedric. I don't know what kind of state I'm going to grasp. By the way, that was no harvesting. No. No. Both. 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 That's a big thing. The guy in the picture, the guy in the picture, you know where he is right now? Marion, Marion Lanfer. Marion graduated from the program. He told me for 40 years, this was the longest he was ever sober and clean. He used to do the small engine repairs for us in the warehouse. Really good guy. Very good mechanic. You knew him, right? So he leaves Souls Harbor. And, you know, he's doing these side jobs like you guys do with Eddie Dean, right? And so he's making some money, and guess what? He buys a SUV. Now, the SUV had engine problems, but Mary knew how to fix it. And so he spent another less than $100 with the gaskets and all that, and he would sit there and fix it. And then he graduated from the program. We'd go, Mary, you could get a job because you're very skilled. Right? And he goes, nah, 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 I want to go back to, he had a place up in, uh, way north of here, like a little farm area. I want to go back there. So guess what he did? He started drinking. Because that was his drug of choice. And within a week after he left Soul Harbor, guess what happened? He got his seventh, seventh DWI. He is looking at, I don't know, Probably 10, 15 years, maybe, maybe even more. Prison. And he, you know, he writes back and forth with Reggie and he said, that was the dumbest thing I ever did. He should have stayed here. He should have stayed here. So we'll cut it. We'll cut it.